My name is Vaughn Becker. I'm an associate professor at Arizona State University and a cognitive scientist, and I'm interested in starting a cross-cultural project that I'm quite excited about, and I'm going to share in this talk. I would like to propose a project that rises to the weird critique that cognitive science is based on unrepresentative samples, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic samples, and uh, furthermore, that the stimuli are often not the best to reveal cross-cultural commonalities and discover differences. This is even more true for evolutionary psychology, which seeks to discern the universal in human nature. I would like to outline a strategy here to lay a more secure foundation for cognitive science, and I sometimes refer to this project as the Association for either Psychonomic or Psychophysiological Evolutionary Science. The idea will be to have a web-based collaboratory in which we can exchange experiments and run parallel studies in multiple cultural contexts and search for the universals in human behavior that lurk beneath the culturally variable elements. Cognitive science has traditionally emphasized simplified or symbolic stimuli in order to study basic processes. This has been a necessary step because bracketing emotional and social complexity is an essential aspect of control to get at the basic parameters of cognition. But what was the brain really designed for? In the real world, the cool reason of the laboratory is a special case. Cognition is hot and objects are saturated with emotion, history, and social context. Let's consider an example in which memory is seen as a signal detection task. We show participants a movie, either a clip from Quinn Escozzi, an arousing but not particularly emotional film, or a clip from Silence of the Lambs, which is thought to evoke self-protection. This is an ideal strategy manipulation. It is something that is not part of the actual experiment. It happens before it, and so any changes are purely psychological rather than stimulus-based. We then show participants a series of faces. We tell them that we're interested in how the brain responds to color, but really we're tracking their eyes and we have a measure of overt visual attention. We then give them a surprise memory task. And the idea is that this ideal strategy manipulation might affect attention, which might lead to differential memory for the different types of faces. But it's also possible that there's a direct path that's unmediated in which a self-protection manipulation focuses attention on the most heuristically threatening faces in the group for our white participants. It's outgroup males, African-American males in these cases. The encoding of African-American male faces indeed is boosted in the self-protection condition on an accuracy corrected for guessing measure. Is this mediated by attention? No. In fact, attention goes down to these faces and when you combine these in a multi-level mediation analysis, you get an even more enhanced effect, which we call the self-protection benefit for outgroup male faces. You can take this benefit and you can plot it relative to the other stimulus types. And it's the only significant case of a self-protection boost. We don't see one for African female faces or Caucasian female faces or Caucasian male faces. We call this the affordance management fundamental motives approach to social cognition. In the standard model, stimuli are perceptually and attentionally processed. They are encoded in, into memory, and then decisions and judgments may result. But we believe that some stimuli inherently have the capacity to prime emotional systems, and these are discrete emotional motivational systems with very adaptive specific goals. Pathogen avoidance is not the same as aggression avoidance or poverty avoidance. These in turn modulate information, pick up at specific stages of cognition, and they directly bias the emotional systems. Executive control processes may moderate these influences as well. This is a blend of traditional cognitive science with evolutionary, ecological, and embodied perspectives. Motivational and emotional systems are thus seen to be attuned to information about the opportunities and threats afforded by others. 
These can be inferred from enduring features like sex and age, transitory displays like angry facial expressions or symptoms of disease, and culturally arbitrary features like facial modifications and decorations that might indicate an in-group or an out-group. Attunements are expected to differ across the levels of cognition, from the very pre-attentional levels at which we may not see any effects of these fundamental motivations, to attentional, encoding, short-term, and long-term memory effects, and of course, judgments and behaviors. We've used methods to explore each of these levels of information processing. For example, we've shown that even though you typically see no evidence of an anger pop-out effect in visual search, uh, happy faces that is, are detected faster, um, you arouse self-protection and you get a significant boost of the ability to detect these angry faces that doesn't seem to be explained by any sort of accuracy cost. So angry faces are rendered more salient by an ideal strategy manipulation. It should be clear from this that we're interested in testing evolutionary hypotheses and we're willing to refute them. The notion that angry faces pop out of crowds was supported by a lot of research that looked at schematic faces, but when you look at studies that actually use pictorial faces, most of them are confounded and there's a variety of happy superiority effects like the one I just showed you. Uh, and that's driven largely by the fact that the face, the happy expression evolved some very salient features, not only the exposed teeth, but also a variety of other things. You can even remove these exposed teeth and you still get this happy superiority effect. Um, in fact, at, at all but the briefest exposure durations, happiness is discriminable, far more discriminable than, it, than are the expressions of anger, fearfulness, or neutrality. The obvious next step for the Affordance Management Fundamental Motives program is to rise to the weird challenge, which is that most of our experiments have been conducted on Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies, and a particular age band within those societies. Is this representative? Well, questions have arisen. There are plenty of pieces of research that suggest that cognitive processing might function invariantly in one case for visual spatial tasks, for example, but not for another case, numeric working memory tasks. Problems here may, however, arise from the abstract or Western stimuli. And I think it's far better to use faces to examine each level of information processing because faces can be adapted to almost any of the experimental methods that can be used to probe these different levels of processing, information processing. Consider a set of coordinated studies across multiple cultural environments in which we look at affordance vigilance and we use multiple cognitive methods to look at multiple cognitive traits. So at the pre-attentional detection level we could use multi-target search, conjunction search, signal detection. We could use Garner interference, flanker task, and dot probe at the, to study attentional and perceptual processes. And we could look at memory search, location memory, and in back for encoding and memory processes. We could discover what universals lurk beneath the culturally variable but functionally equivalent social categories if we do this in enough cultural contexts. We could understand how critical social learning is to deferentially engaging uh, these different cognitive endophenotypes. The very basic challenges and opportunities in the local ecology will evoke a certain personality in one environment and not another. We could discover how variable the cultural solutions are, like the basic level categories, to the recurrent problems of social life, and to the unprecedented novel ones, like the massive increase in technology that we've had to grapple with in recent decades. And that actually allows us to then design for a more universal psychology. So the applied aspects of this project are quite profound. Three contrasts are essential to rise against the weird challenge. First, industrialized societies versus small-scale societies. India and the West Indies, I have collaborators that will be anchoring projects in each of these locations. Western versus non-Western societies in terms of industrialized societies, well, 
Japan and Singapore would be ideal, but I have yet to find collaborators here. Finally, contemporary Americans versus the rest of the West. I have a variety of people in Western Europe that are interested in doing this kind of project. We can operationalize concrete questions that involve attention to social threats and memory for social threats, or attention to social opportunities and memory for social opportunities. Indeed, a variety of hypotheses can contrast specific kinds of threat. For example, disease versus violent threat. The implications also include gene by environment which differentially build threat vigilant endophenotypes. Childhood adversity and a gene like the 5-HTT-LPR gene, the serotonin transporter gene, can interact to create both uh, anxiety vigilant types or positive and resilient types. Indeed, a whole set of candidate genes might inform how people perform in these tasks across a, a variety of cultural environments. There is also an opportunity to look at event-related potentials, which can reveal the internal processing differences that underlie these behavioral manifestations. For example, we've conducted one study using an oddball task with neutral faces as standards and the occasional expressive face, either an angry or happy male or female, as the oddball. There's an oddball. There's an oddball. In this task, we also use an ideal strategy manipulation, either showing people pictures of violence before a block of oddball trials, or showing people pictures of arousing sports before a block of oddball trials. This ideal strategy manipulation is entirely within subjects and contrasts a control condition versus a self-protection condition. When we look at angry male oddballs, we indeed see an enhancement of the P3A or the P3 at least, as a function of that self-protection manipulation. So we're seeing an, a modulation of the P3 for the oddball. This is for the angry male. And when we compare this to that for angry females, we see no similar difference. So it's very precisely about angry males. Is it just about males? Well, that comparison also shows that it's very precisely about angry males, the most threat-relevant face in the display. This preliminary proof of concept suggests a variety of next steps. For example, can manipulating disease avoidance or mating goals promote an attentional vigilance to faces that are relevant to those goals? Will it do so with the same components, the self-protection effects, or will they be later? Will other tasks, like filtering, better isolate the critical components? Will these effects show up when goal-relevant features are ignored? We now have a study in which we've done this, or when working memory is engaged. Does self-protection make us vigilant to other negative facial expressions? Does self-protection make us vigilant to other cues to threat, like out-group status? Key now is to find collaborators who can anchor the industrialized Western versus industrialized non-Western contrast. This is an ambitious set of research projects that will fundamentally broaden evolutionary cognitive science with this set of nested hypotheses that can be tested within a single experimental paradigm. We're looking for departments with strong human subject research programs and eager graduate students, postdocs, and potential colleagues. Japan and Singapore provide two ideal locations to anchor this industrialized Western versus industrialized non-Western contrast. My general conclusions, cognitive science is now entering a new era of functional exploration and explanation that must reckon with affect in a more nuanced and cross-culturally valid way. Extended, embodied, ecological, and evolutionary perspectives have an unappreciated consilience that will inform this new evolutionary cognitive science. And it's best revealed by work at the intersection of social, affective, and cognitive sciences, as I propose to do here.